Okay. Uh, we finished yesterday on encapsulation. There was a good suggestion that it's about isolation. And now uh, we move to type. Um, so type is a little bit more complex issue um, because even though all programming languages, even the dynamic ones, they do deal with type. Uh, there are different type systems and type means different things in different programming languages. So we will come back to, to type um, a little bit later. I don't want to spend too much time on it right now, but we will revisit this, um, this concept uh, you know, in subsequent lectures. Um, so let's move on. Uh, object versus instance. So this one, again, is a little bit runty. There is no very clear distinction in many programming languages between those two things. So for example, if we talk about C++, we often use those two terms interchangeably. We say object or we say an instance of a class, which is an object, right? In Java, it's the same. We also use those terms interchangeably. Uh, in some programming languages, we don't have a concept of classes necessarily, or we do, but it's slightly different concept than in C++. And then we mostly talk about structs. And when a language has structs, which you instantiate, it's a little bit weird to talk about struct instance as an object because it doesn't necessarily carry on behavior with it. it the behavior is not encapsulated inside the, the, the instance of a struct. Um, so in those languages, uh, sometimes we just use the word instance instead. Uh, the typical case is in Swift. In Swift, the, uh, the designers of the language, they decided that because it is kind of distinguished feature between being an object of a class or being an instance of a struct. Uh, they use those two terms for those two different things. So they kind of distinguish what is an instance and what is an object. But intuitively, I think you should um, you should get the kind of the idea in object oriented programming or in, in str struct pr uh, based programming what the difference is. Instance also means instantiation of a type in general, right? So if I have, you know, um, a, a particular type um, in, in, in my kind of an abstract representation of some sort of concepts in my language, and then I instantiate the type to some kind of concrete instance, usually, you know, the word instance is the word to use for that. Um, so unless it is a class instance, we don't use the, the, uh, the term object. Uh, it's more reserved for the object-oriented um, vocabulary, right? So <clears throat> next one, class. What is a class? And what is the relationship between class and object or an instance? I kind of talked a little bit about it, but let me ask you a question. Can I have a class which is represented as an object, as an instance. Yeah, Ricard suggests that yes, I can. I can instantiate a class, yes, but can I have class itself being an object? Yeah, good. So in C++, I can't. So in C++, those two things are very well separated. I have classes, which are my type system. I, I represent them in the languages as, as kind of types. I can declare them. So I can declare a, a, a particular class, you know, foo. Um, but I cannot represent that class itself as an object. I can represent an instance of that class as an object, but not the class itself, right? So for example, in Smalltalk, 
classes are first class objects as well. Everything in the language is an object, including the types that you define, which is the classes, right? So now you get a bit of a feel of why some people claim that, for example, Smalltalk is much more object oriented than C++, because in Smalltalk, everything and they mean really everything, including the classes, are objects, right? And it kind of gets you to think, oh yeah, that's kind of weird, right? Like how can you know a class be an object at the same time? And then instances of that class are also objects. And you know, once you start using it, it kind of makes sense because you treat everything as objects and you kind of send messages to it and then you do stuff with it, right? So the type then offers you certain things that you can do with it, right? Um, in Java, uh, you can represent uh, certain things as um, instances as well. So if I go to my Vim again, uh, some of you will not know Java, but uh, those of you who, who know Java, um, we have a primitive type int, which represents integers, but I have also a type called integer, which represents an object, which is the like okay so so integer is a class which represents an integer number and then i can have an instance um instance of integer like you know I, if i say integer a then a is a variable pointing to the instance of of integer but i also have integer class which i can use and i can do things with so i actually have this as an instance of the class itself. And then I can check, for example, what methods it, this type has and stuff like this, right? So in C++, you don't have it. And that's why some people say, well, you know, C++ is a very weak object-oriented language because it doesn't have all those kind of facilities which some other object-oriented languages have. Um, in Java, you do have this reflection and you can instantiate a class as a first class <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird to talk about it. It's the first, um, it's something that is kind of a core in the language. So the, the objects are kind of, you can represent classes as objects, right? Um, right, so um, next one, let's see. Pointer versus references. That one should be easy. You should be all familiar with, um, you know, pointers from C++, uh, from C. Um, pointer arithmetic, you know, traversing arrays using uh, pointers. And then C++ comes along, especially the modern incarnations. And they say, yeah, it's kind of a bit risky to deal with all those pointers. Let's kind of um, deal with references. Um, and th that kind of um, was revolutionized in a sense uh, through Java, because in Java, you don't really have pointers, you only have references, and then you pass everything by reference. Um, and the, the kind of the pointer concept is kind of hidden. So you're shielded by making some mistakes because you're sort of dealing only with references. And then modern C++ is pushing you towards that as well. So instead of directly dealing with row pointers, which just of course can still do, uh, we're dealing much more with references. Um, Again, the, the pointer versus reference um, uh, naming and uh, um, meaning of those words depends a little bit on the language. And for example, in Golang, they do use both. They use pointers and references and they have kind of specific meaning which is slightly different to what is meant in C or C++ uh, world. So you have to kind of attune yourself a little bit. Um, also in, um, uh, usually when we talk about pointers, we don't talk about um, the language or the runtime system maintaining the livelihood of pointers. It's more uh, livelihood and kind of existence of references that we talk about. So in those two contexts, we usually often use both terms of, yeah, for meaning for meaning that so if I allocate memory and I have a pointer to that allocated memory like it, it can be some type or some struct or whatever that is uh, usually this allocation which I did um, 
is kind of represented as a pointer. And then when I talk about this pointer, I don't really kind of mean that um, the runtime system will manage my pointer, right? It's more if I'm talking about managing whether the pointer is valid or not, I would actually use the word reference uh, because then in the scope, in your kind of, um, um, in, in the code that you have, you have to have some sort of variable, some sort of constant or some sort of uh, representation of that pointer. And then we talk about the, the livelihood of that reference, right? So again, it's a little bit nuanced, uh, but um, I'm sure pointer and reference is kind of fine with, um, with you. So one thing that might not be natural is a concept of mutable and unmutable, immutable variable. And what does it mean? And what constant means? So I, yeah, so in C and C++, do we have immutable variables or we don't have? What do you think? No, good. So um, Dennis is saying we don't have immutable variables. That's correct. Do you know a language which you do have immutable variables? Rust, very good. So Rust has immutability kind of as a uh, citizen of the language, it's very common to start with everything being immutable. And then uh, you have to force certain variables to be mutable if you really need that. Uh, and there is a keyword, MUT, and then you're forcing you know, some variables to be mutable by design. Otherwise, by design, all variables are immutable. Uh, why do you think is that? Why, why do you think Rust uh, decided to do that? Some ideas? No ideas? Well, you know, um, when, when you're writing code and when you're reading code, um, you have kind of a block of text and then you have certain variables which point to things. And then imagine two situations. One situation is all variables are immutable. So once you read that you know a is 10 everywhere in your code a is 10 right and that's one situation the other situation is all variables are mutable and they can change value right um so now you're kind of reading the page another page you know it's a very long method let's say uh and you have to understand what the method does in which case do you think it will be easier for you to understand the logic or to understand what's happening in the immutable case or in the mutable case. So if I have, yeah, again, just for the context, um, that's right. So if, you know, I have some sort of block, uh, very long. I have some, some stuff happening in the middle and then I have, you know, let's use the notation like this. I said, you know, A is 10, okay? Or whatever that the A is. Um, and then there is a lot of stuff happening. And then at the end, I have something like, you know, C equals A, you know, um, A square, right? So now like to understand what is C, like how easy is that? It's, it's kind of pretty straightforward. Like the moment I read the first line, I kind of don't care what's in the middle and I know what C is, right? I, I know C is 100. Uh, if I have mutability in, I actually have to read every single line what's in the middle to know what C is because, you know, A could have mutated under my feet and like I read A is 10, but, you know, somewhere here, A could have changed. And now A is not 10 anymore. And like to know what C is, I need to follow all this middle shit uh, to know what C is, right? So mutability introduces kind of additional noise. Uh, so that's one, one reason why immutability is kind of better. <clears throat> the other reason is 
if you are not a human being, you are kind of a compiler and you are looking at this code and you're doing some analysis and the programmer declared that A is 10 and the language has immut immutability built in, then you know no matter what happens in the middle, A is 10 at that point, right? So when the compiler and the runtime system is dealing with your code, and if let's say you have a multi-core processor and you have things like this, the runtime system can say, oh, hey, great. Uh, we can do this calculation on another core while all this middle stuff is going on because we know that C should be calculated and C should be 100 and it doesn't matter what is going on in the middle here, right? So I can do certain things in parallel, right? I can dynamically parallelize execution of my code because I know I have certain guarantees of what the logic requires me to do. Uh, so immutability from one hand adds a bit of consistency and readability to the code such that it's actually easier to think about the code and reason about it and read it and understand. Uh, from the other hand, it's a fantastic tool for parallelization because I know I have no race condition, I have no conflict, I don't have any resource sharing. I mean, you know, this line is pretty straightforward and I can execute it at any time while I'm doing some other things here, right? So if I have another, you know, variable uh, which is declared at the beginning of the section and I have some stuff going on with uh, in the middle and I have another calculation here uh, related to B and it doesn't include A, like, you know, um, no, so I have another calculation including B, uh, involving B, but um, it doesn't involve A the compiler and runtime system can say, okay, I can do this, I can do this, and I can do this together in parallel even, or you know, concurrently while I'm doing anything like here, right? So immutability kind of offers us this sort of transformations, this type of uh, abilities. Um, so that's why we have a concept of variables which are mutable and immutable. Um, and that's why Rust kind of introduced uh, immutability. Uh, and at the same time, you have Haskell where you have immutability taken to the next level because it's actually quite hard to make things mutable. So everything by design is immutable. Um, and then to achieve mutability, you have to do certain tricks. So in, in like languages like C or C++ or, uh, or Rust, if you need mutability, like, you know, in C and C++, it's super easy. Like everything is always mutable. Um, and in Rust, you just introduce this keyword mute and, you know, things behave as in C or C++. O almost, yeah, of course, there are some small uh, adjustments. But in Haskell, well, you will realize mutability is kind of um, difficult to achieve in a sense, right? You don't have mutable variables. Um, all right, so that's variable. So what's constant? What's the difference between a variable or immutable variable and a constant? So again, like if I have some sort of a section of the code. Um, and let's say it is, um, yeah, it's uh, let's say C++. So if I say const, um, so what um, what that would give me? That would give me kind of a constant, um, but how is that different to immutable variable? That's right. So it is different because I cannot, for example, say uh, const int a equals, and there is something here which the compiler cannot do, right? So if I, I say I want a to be something, but at the time of compile, 
the compiler cannot work it out what it is, then it will say, I, you cannot do that, right? Um, I could still have a variable like this, of course, but I cannot have a constant like this, right? So that's why it's a little bit complicated with, um, with C++ because we have um, something called constant expression. And the constant expression is giving me certain abilities, certain calculations that I can put here such that the compiler can kind of work something out and make it into the constant, right? So constants mean that it's a compile time thing. So once the compiler is done with the compilation, uh, the constants values are set and that's it. They are set forever. Um, you sometimes uh, have, um, you know, in your .h file, you can say uh, max equals something. You can kind of define, um, you can define, um, you know, um, a certain constant like this um, by the preprocessor. And then this, this uh, literal, this kind of a symbol is substituted with this value every time the compiler kind of recognizes it, right? Um, so th there is, you know, um, variables are more runtime things, uh, constants are compile time things. Um, in dynamic languages, uh, no, in languages where you don't have the uh, compilation step, usually the, there is no distinction. Um, but when you have a, a, a compiler, we do distinguish between all those three between, between all those three things. All right. Um, so I did mention the term before, but what is a literal? What would you say, you know, in the exam, if I asked you, okay, uh, write in a sentence what literal is, what, what would you say? And give examples. Anyone? It's quite easy. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So Hocken is suggesting that, yeah, let, let me open the editor again. Um, so things like numbers, like two, three, uh, 2.0, um, uh, strings, Right, those things are li literals. Uh, a literal is effectively, it means what it is, <laughs> right? So like this is a string and it is a string. This is a floating point number and it is a floating point number. If you want in uh, some languages, you know, that would be a floating point number with double precision. So sometimes you need to do this, right? There is a difference between these two, right? This is a, a literal um, and this one is a literal, right? So what other literals do you know? So those are kind of the standard ones, which uh, I let, let me guess all languages have. Um, yeah, another one is true false. Very good. Um, those are literals as well. What what other literals do you know? Yeah, we have ranges. So for example, notation like this. Um, so numbers from one to 10, uh, that's, that's uh, represented as a literal. <clears throat> so, um, so, so th that doesn't exist in C++, but in, uh, in the Rust you have that. Maybe in some C++ versions we will have uh, ranges. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure actually if the uh, latest standard uh, introduced uh, ranges, but ranges are quite uh, common. Uh, 
So range is a common literal structure. Um, Languages which are quite um, rich in terms of literals are easier to program because, for example, you can um, construct things in text and then they become what they are, such, such that you don't need to construct them programmatically. You can just construct them, like, you know, just by, by typing. Yeah, so. Okay, it's a little bit tricky to explain. So let, let's let me do an example. So let's say um, let's say I have um, some sort of language and I, I need to represent a list and I want to represent a list which is from numbers from um, uh, one to ten, right? So what I can say is that L is a list and then I would say L um, for e for i uh, from one to 10, uh, and then I would do L at i, right? So at that point here, um, I, have, um, I have my list, uh, which contains numbers from one to 10, right? Uh, and I, I had to type kind of some sort of logic to create this L, right? Um, and then if I, for example, call a function, I have some function, um, F and I pass list to it, then I sort of achieve what I wanted, right? So now what I want is I want to be able to pass here a literal which represents a list of things from one to 10, right? Um, and in some languages you can do that, in some languages you can't. And in those languages that you can't, you stuck with, with writing some logic. Right, so you actually have to do some some sort of logic, or you know you have to declare some variable, you have to instantiate you know initialize it, then instantiate some content, and then do some logic, and then at, at the end you sort of have it. Uh, but if you can represent a list of things as a literal, it's kind of uh, more convenient because you can just type stuff like this, right? Uh, it, it's the same. Uh, when we had this discussion with uh, constants, right? If I have, um, if I want to say constant of type x is x, and then I can put a literal here, then I, I can have a constant. If I cannot put a literal here, I typically cannot have a constant of that type, right? Um, often you want to throw something in and you just want some sort of an instance of something, then you know, if you need to instantiate it by code, it's one way of doing it. And in C++, most of the time you have to do it this way. Um, but if you can instantiate things, you know, via the literal, then it get a bit more convenient, right? So for example, you have um, things like um, in some languages, um, you have things like, um, I can say, um, oh, mama, papa, right? And then what that would be? So that would typically represent the list of two items, right? So if I need, to pass to F um, some sort of literal, then I could just generate um, a list of two items like this and then pass it. Um, in some languages, even though you can do the literal like this, which represents a list, you cannot directly pass it to a function. You have to have some sort of variable which points to that, to the um, instance of that literal, right? So it, it gets a bit complicated. But what, what I want you to take out of this discussion is that languages that are rich in literals and languages which allow you to define different types of literals directly are easier to code with, they are more expressive and they're sort of uh, nice to, to, to work with. Languages which don't have it require you to be kind of um, um, <clears throat> procedural 
about all the things that you need to work with, right? So for example, in, um, um, in some languages like um, you can define a literal which um, you, you can kind of define your own types of literals. And then for example, you can define a currency. So what you can do is you can say 20 euro, uh, which is a literal. And then you can say 20 USD, uh, let, let's call it um, like this. Um, and then you can say 10 nook. Right, and then those are literals which represent a value of a certain type of currency, and then you can do kind of operations on them. So I could say uh, things like this, or if I say um, things like this, um, the compiler can say, "Oh, look, look, look! You cannot really add those two things. Like, not, not the compiler. The runtime system uh, can complain or oh, compiler." Um, that the type of this and this is different and therefore there is no plus operator which can combine those two different types, right? Um, in most languages, uh, we don't do that. Like you do need to have certain expressiveness and, and certain um, uh, expressive power to, 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 to do that. So for example, in Ruby, you can, you can do those type of literals and then de declare, declare your own type and then use it, right? Uh, another common one is, you know, complex numbers. So for example, 20 plus 10 I, right? Um, that becomes a complex number literal. And then I can use it um, in place of a complex number. With languages which allow you to do that, it's kind of really easy to express a complex number. And um, a languages which you don't have it, you probably will need two lines of code because you have to initialize the, the real part and then the imaginary part, right? Um, so literals are important and the expressiveness of the, um, of the language often comes from the ability to define your own literals or from how the language uh, deals with literals, right? All right, uh, next. All right, that should be relatively easy, but you might have not uh, seen that uh, in action yet. So <clears throat> what's the difference between a function and a method? When we use the term function and when we use the term method. Yeah, should be quite easy from C++. Yeah, so uh, good, good uh, um, association. So if I have a class, um, you know, I have a class X and I have, um, you know, I have some sort of a function inside the class we usually say f is a method, right? And then if I have um, I have a function here, we would say g is a function, f is a method, right? Uh, roughly speaking, some pseudo C++ ish code, right? Um, so g is yes, a function. It's not kind of encapsulated in any of the classes. Um, therefore, it's a function. F is sort of encapsulated inside X, therefore it is a method. Um, the difference is that functions, so function uh, takes parameters, parameters and uh, returns a value. Um, methods also take parameters and return a value, but methods have additional thing. Um, methods are kind of the same, the same as above. Plus, they have a context, right? And what I mean by context? 
um, they have additional thing which is kind of uh, attached to them, right? So what is attached to the function f that is not attached to function to function g? So what do I have access to here that I don't have access to here? It doesn't exist. Yes, exactly. So in, in Java or in some other languages, you have this. And in some languages, you have self or some other mechanism for referring to this context, right? That doesn't exist here, right? Um, so typically, when we have a function which has something like this or self that you can access, that means it's a method. <laughs> If you have a function which doesn't have this type of self or this, that's a function, right? Um, so that's kind of like how we use those terms. Um, very good. So that's quite straightforward. Um, it's not uh, limited to classes, right? So in some languages uh, like Rust or Golang, you have structs which you define um, yeah, you, you kind of uh, have a struct X and then you have some fields like, you know, typically, again, let's use some sort of a C notation. So I have some field one and float field two, right? Uh, and I don't have kind of any behavior here, uh, but I can have a behavior here. And then if I do have behavior here, that would typically be called a method because I have some sort of a context which I carry for this method to operate on, right? Um, in some languages, you declare the behavior outside, but the behavior has access, like if I have some sort of a, a method um, here and I'm doing something, some logic here, I will have some sort of access to what the instance of that struct is. And therefore this method will kind of operate on the instance of this, of this struct. And then I will call it a method, not a function, right? Uh, in Golang, um, we will talk about it later, but uh, you have two ways of, um, of declaring a function. So I can have a function which takes, um, which takes, um, so if I say A is of type X, I can pass it to, to my function F uh, directly. And then I have a function which takes an instance of X as a parameter. And we will say this is a function or I can declare um, that I have a function F which is operating in the context of the instance and it doesn't take any parameters but it has access to that uh, instance of that, um, of that struct. And then I, we will call it a method, right? So in some languages you have, um, you, you can kind of implement uh, the behavior in two ways, one way using methods and one way using um, using functions. Uh, just to, 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 to make sure that when we say function, function doesn't have any additional context apart from the parameters which are passed in the, in the list. Um, sometimes in some languages, methods look like functions because there is nothing extra. The actual instance is passed as a first parameter. Uh, that's how the, the system kind of implements methods, but we still will call them methods, right? Um, all right. So next one, pure functions. That should be pretty easy as well. So what is a pure function? So let's use a C notation. If I have a function fun and it takes an integer and returns an integer, uh, when this function would be pure? Yes, Hokon is correct. If there is no side effects, uh, the function is called pure. So what does it mean that, that there is no side effects? So there is some behavior here. So,
right? So if I call fun with something here, if I call fun with 10 and it gives me 10 back, exactly. No matter what happens, no matter when I do it, and no, you know, it doesn't depend on anything. If I give it 10, I am guaranteed that it will be 10 back, right? Uh, then if this is guaranteed, then this function is pure. Uh, if it is not guaranteed, if inside a function I have, you know, an if statement, if some global variable is bigger than, you know, 10, return 100 or 1000, otherwise else, you know, return 10, then that function is not pure. It kind of depends on some global state, right? Um, yeah, I should, if we sticking to this notation, yeah, makes sense. So if the function doesn't depend on anything but its own logic and the parameter, and it always produces the same output for the same input, the function is pure. Um, okay, so what's the big deal? Why, you know, why C++ or C doesn't care? Yeah, they, they, they don't care because the runtime system doesn't really make much use of it. But again, same as with mutability, you can imagine that um, reasoning about functions which depend on global state, for example, is much harder than reasoning about function which don't, which are kind of um, pure and they only depend on the internal logic because then the behavior of the function is defined here and it's always the same. Like, um, of course you can say the behavior of the other method with the reference to global variables is always the same as well. It's just that I don't know what the global variable value is. Therefore, I don't really know what the function will do with, you know, with a given parameter. But if the logic doesn't depend on the global state, I know exactly what for the given input, the given output will be. So then I have, um, Again, I have two cool side effects, right? So one side effect is um, parallelism, right? So for example, if I have a function fun one, which is pure, and I have another function fun two, which is pure also, right? I have um, two function fun one and fun two. And then somewhere in the code, um, I have a block block of code and I have something like that A equals fun, fun one with 20. And then I have B equals fun two with 30, okay? Or some, yeah, some variable or whatever. Um, and I am analyzing my, my structure and I see, oh yeah, this is a pure function. This is a pure function. So I have, you know, um, some conclusions. Um, the order in which I call, I execute it does not matter, right? I can execute this line first or this line first and the logic will be exactly the same because I have a guarantee that those two functions are pure. Therefore, the output only depends on the input. It doesn't depend on anything else. So it doesn't matter if I do this one first or this one first, right? So that's already a cool thing because if I'm executing my code, like uh, I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I'm a runtime system and I have this already in my cache, I say, yeah, shit, like I already have it in the cache. So let's do it first. It will be much faster than like, um, dropping the cache, reading the other function, executing it, and then dropping the cache and reading this one to, to do this in this order, right? So I can reorder things depending what I already have in the cache and kind of make things much more um, efficient. Um, so the order is that doesn't matter. And I can do both. I can do both at the same time in parallel, right? Uh, because, you know, if I have two cores, and I have my uh, program cache. Uh, so, so I have a single core, but I have two threads 
you know, hardware threads, and I have my program cache kind of being shared, and I have th those two functions there, I can actually execute both at the same time, and it will be final as well, right? So parallelism is one cool thing that you get from pure functions. What else do you get from pure functions? So let's say I called this, right? Right. Um, so imagine that I have um, for i uh, equals from i from zero to thousand, right? I need to do something in a loop uh, and I'm calling this function over and over again, right? Um, if this is a pure function and I've already calculated it once, like let's say this is kind of a complex, it takes one second, right? Um, it takes one second to compute fun one, right? And I'm calling it here a thousand times. In normal language like C++, because I'm doing it and the compiler and runtime system doesn't know that it's a pure function, they will have to execute it every single time because they know, you know, some shit could have changed and the output might be different this time, right? But if this function is pure, the output will never be different. So I don't need to spend one second recalculating it because I know it's the same value every single time I call this function. So if I calculated it once, I don't need to calculate it ever again, right? Um, this technique is called uh, memoization. So memoization. Memoization is basically like cache, right? So the runtime system, once it calls a pure function once, it just caches the output and say, okay, if I get this call again, I just don't do that stuff. I just, you know, read the value, the output from the cache. Um, so languages or runtime systems, which allow you to express purity, which express you to deal with pure functions can do certain optimizations for you internally and don't recalculate stuff that's been already calculated because you know we know it will be always the same. So they can cache it, right? Um, so in some languages, you have a huge uh, usage of this technique. Uh, some languages don't do that. Uh, so if you as a programmer in C++ know that this is a pure function and it takes one second, and then you know that you're doing a loop here, you should not call this function, you know, a uh, thousand times. What you should do is you should just call it once here. So I have my function one called here, right? And then I just use this, this stuff here or not even introduce a, just use AA everywhere I, I need, you know, the, 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 the out, output of this, of this calculation, right? Um, but it kind of requires you to think about it and it requires you to do those optimizations. If you have memoization and if you are calling um, pure functions, sometimes uh, the complexity of the program will not allow you to do this type of by hand optimizations. You will just need to call a function again, right? Uh, then, you know, the, the runtime system can, can help you. So Haskell is one of the languages which do have uh, pure functions. Uh, and in some languages, you can declare that certain things don't have side effects and they are pure such that the runtime system can take advantage of it and can kind of optimize it for, uh, for this particular behavior, right? Any questions about it so far? If you... If, if I'm talking and you have a question, just raise your hand also, or just ask the question in the in the chat. Um, let me see how many we have. We have one more and then we'll do a break. So the final one is side effects. Great, that's, that's great because we have already talked about it. So um, some side effects are in a form of global state. Uh, some side effects are in a, in a form of you putting something to the outside world, right? So for example, if I have my, um, so let's go back to this, um, uh, to this fun one uh, example, right? So if I have if statement here asking about some global state, um, the global state is the side effect, 
right? I am dependent on, on a global state, but what I can also do, I can say, um, let's don't call it global state, it's too much typing, let's just call it G. So I have some variable G which lives outside of this function and I can say G now is 10, right? So this, this is a side effect. I modified something outside of this function uh, and outside of the output of this function uh, somewhere else, right? So this is a side effect. But if I also, let, let's say I don't have it, right? I, I don't, um, I don't manipulate any global state, uh, but what I do in, in the scope of the program, but what I do, I, I kind of, um, I call print, right? So I, I, I print something to the screen. So I, I have some calculations and then I, I print something, right? So now if I have my loop, uh, so I have this, this loop from one to, to 2000 and I'm calling um, fun one with 10 and I have a system where I don't have memorization, then I will see, uh, I will see hello thousand times. But if I, if the runtime system memorized it, kept the value uh, and didn't call it, then I would see this only once, right? Because I executed it once and then I remember the output uh, and the output depends on the input and you know that cannot be changed. So I know the output is always the same, uh, but I have a side effect in a form of you know the terminal printing me something one time or thousand times. That makes a huge difference as well. So this is a side effect also. So accessing an IO, accessing standard input or standard output or accessing files, it's a form of side effect as well, even though it doesn't change a kind of a global state of the program. And even though this function always returns the same value, no matter what, but it has those kind of additional things, those additional effects, and we call them side effects, right? So it's both the, uh, the manipulation of the streams or, or the files and the, the context which still lives inside the runtime system. Those are both called side effects. Um, in one case, it's kind of outside of the entire system. And in the other, it's outside of this, of this function. Like it's some sort of global state which lives in the scope of my program. All right, so let's have, um, let's have a short break. Uh, we will resume, like how long break do you guys need? Uh, 20 past nine is okay. Yeah, all right, so 20 past nine. And we continue.
All right. It's cold outside. All right, so uh, we finished this. Um, we have a little bit more terminology to deal with. Um, so let's move on. Programming. Class versus traits versus meta classes. Yes, we're gonna deal with this, but not now. <laughs> so you will know those terms um, at the end of the course, uh, but not, it's too much to deal with it right now. And we need to get a bit more of a feel. Um, I just signal that those are things that we will learn in this course. And um, uh, with C++, unfortunately, we don't have necessarily time to dive into metaprogramming using the, the metaprogramming features of C++. And um, I encourage you to experiment with it when we will be dealing with metaprogramming on Haskell or other languages. Uh, they have simple syntax and you can express certain meta things kind of easier, but it doesn't mean they don't exist in, in C++. I mean, uh, some don't, yes, so some things you cannot do, but certain things you can do. It's just that the syntax is a bit more complicated, uh, but it, it, it is kind of a trade-off between different languages. Um, yeah, anyway, we come back to that. So let's not talk about it more. Um, ballet three. That's kind of a bug. <laughs> uh, all right, so inheritance. So from C++ world, what is inheritance? What do we use inheritance for? What is inheritance in? Yeah, so very good uh, suggestions. So Sebastian talks about code reusability. That's perfect. Uh, Elling about subclasses getting traits from parent classes. Yes, extending a class. Yes, we want to reuse some state or some context and some behavior uh, potentially. Uh, that's what inheritance is. It, it's either or or both. Uh, in C++, we can... Um, extend the class and if the class had some uh, fields uh, or attributes, we can kind of carry them over. Uh, the class can have private ones, so those are not carried over. Uh, it has certain behaviors which the subclass can reuse and, and so on. Uh, inheritance in like, you know, 70s and 80s was really hyped. Um, and a lot of faith was, um, it, it kind of revolutionized the way programmers were structuring code and thinking about code. Um, in 2000s, uh, so the last say 10 years, there was a bit of a pushback. Uh, inheritance lost the, the appeal um, and we don't use it everywhere as we used to. Uh, we um, substitute um, inheritance with a different relationships uh, because they are more flexible and they are kind of uh, easier to, to manage. Um, so first, multiple inheritance, which C++ kind of offered, uh, is, is powerful. It's, it's very powerful, but it leads to a lot of problems. Um, and in Java, for example, they reduced it to single kind of a single line inheritance. You don't have multiple multiple inheritance, but you can do multiple inheritance from on the kind of interfaces or protocol level. And that's where the, the, the migration kind of happens. So we still use inheritance and it's useful. Uh, we sort of push the abstraction a little bit out and we sort of use it in traits or in kind of meta classes. And then on the normal type system, we we try not to abuse it. I mean, of course, there are some use cases where inheritance is the brilliant solution for a problem, um, but not everywhere. Uh, the typical example that has been always given is that, you know, UI elements and user interface kind of widgets are a great example of doing object-oriented design and using inheritance for, you know, having some sort of a canvas 
and then kind of a, a, a button, let's say, is inheriting from the canvas, and then you have some fancy buttons, and you know you have buttons with images on them, and it, it is kind of nice to have this inheritance hierarchy and 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 so on. And yeah, I I, I mean it, it makes sense, and it, it it's easy to work with a toolkit which is object oriented in such a way. Um, but there are some UI toolkits which are not object oriented and they have certain benefits because they can do certain things certain way. Um, so I'm not so sure that uh, you have to do certain things certain way. I mean, we are inventing new ways of dealing with things and this object oriented designs and this kind of inheritance based designs, they have their strengths, but they have their limitations and you know, you, you have to be careful, like what do you need to achieve? Um, we will talk a little bit about it as well in the context of traits and meta classes and, and, and so on. And we will come back to this in the context of design, like how we are con uh, conceptualizing a problem and how we are building the relationships between elements. Um, there are some simple scenarios where, you know, um, inheritance-based, object-oriented based designs are just perfect fit and that's it, that you, you, you know. Uh, but if you want extensible, um, reusable and kind of a more agile design, sometimes you need to make adjustments. Um, so yeah, we, we will come back to that. All right, so that's, uh, I don't know what the ballot three was for. <laughs> so we have two more. Um, so give me examples of arithmetic operations. That's easy. Yeah, perfect. So we have plus minus, you know, modulo, things like this. Okay. You know, most all languages have it. Um, some very esoteric languages may be forcing you to do arithmetic, all arithmetic, let's say just by addition or something like this. But um, most programming languages, normal programming languages have it, logic operations. Yeah, exactly. And or um, XOR sometimes, uh, not, yes. Easy. Uh, again, all languages have it, right? So if you're learning a new language, well, you need to understand how to do arithmetic operations, how to do logic operations. Makes sense, right? Uh, next one. Well, control flow operation. So give me examples of control flow operations. Loops, yeah. So let's let's open this one. It's it, we need some text. All right. So <clears throat> let's say uh, control flow. We have, for example, loops. Yeah. So we can have a for loop uh, while. Um, what else? Um, some languages have concept of a loop, repeat, <laughs> different uh, different things for loops. Uh, what else do we have? Go to, yes. So we have kind of a jump, right? Um, so jump, uh, we have with go to, yes, we have, um, yeah, so if else statements can be a form of a jump, right? So it's um, it uh, allows, th this one is kind of an unconditional go somewhere. This one is go here or go there. <clears throat> so you have kind of a two, um, two possible pathways. So, so let's, let's say a single, um, so one way street, 
uh, here we have two ways, right? And then we have a switch statement uh, and we can have kind of a n way, right? Um, great, so anything else? Yeah, so we have concepts like uh, continue, break, that's kind of related a little bit to the loops. Um, we also have um, like, you know, a function call itself is a form of kind of a go-to statement, right? It's kind of an unconditional saying, okay, now do this, go over there, do this sequence and then come back here, right? So if I have, you know, I'm doing some stuff uh, and, and then I say fun one, it means, okay, you know, go to fun one, do what fun one instructions are and come back here and continue, right? Continue here, right? So calling a function is a form of a control operation, control flow operation. All right. Um, so uh, let me see what the next one is. I cannot see so expression. So let me come back one, one step. All right, so if I am a designer of a new programming language, I hope all of you will design your own programming language at some point, because that's what you know uh, computer scientists and programmers do, the good ones. They build their own programming language. So just for fun, uh, when you're building your programming language, uh, could you build one without arithmetic operations? You couldn't. Uh, could you build one without a logic operations? It would be not possible neither. And could you build one without a control flow operations? So what, what we what we want here is some sort of a programming language that can. Uh, express any other program in any other programming language such that you can compile it to this one right uh, or transcompile it so let's say i have a program in c++ uh, and now i have my language called marius and i want to be able to convert the c++ code into marius such that it will behave the same right so i will need to have those three things right w will you agree on that or do you think you could achieve it without one of those I don't think you can challenge that. So I, I think we all agree that you need some form of arithmetic operations built in into Marius language, logic operations and control flow operations. Okay, so, um, so now how many operations do you really need? Well, you can, um, you can express quite a lot with a very limited set of operations. Like for example, you can express multiplication by addition, or you can express even subtraction by addition with the overflow. So if I have a concept of a um, overflow, I can use this concept to simulate subtraction if I only have addition and so on and so forth, right? So just as a curiosity, I will tell you that the smallest instruction set for a virtual machine or for the kind of a virtual computer, which has ability to execute um, any C++ program or any program for that matter, which has arithmetic logic and control flow operations is a virtual machine, which just has one instruction, okay? So in, in theory, you could build everything just using a single instruction based computer and that instruction will necessarily be a little bit complex because it has to mix all those three elements, right? So if you kind of think about it, you will uh, realize that this instruction needs to be able to do arithmetic. So you have to, okay, so first of all, I have to have some um, 
um, type. I have to have some kind of a memory, um, some storage, right? So I need to have to, to be able to read and to write uh, something from from memory, right? So I have to have some mechanism for accessing um, accessing memory. Uh, then I have some like I have to have a concept of a program. So I have some sort of a sequence of instructions that I need to do. Um, so you, you could use this kind of a concept like in basic that I have uh, lines of code and I can jump or go to to a particular label or particular line of code. Um, so if I have those two mechanisms to add, to read something from somewhere, to, to write something from to, to into somewhere, and I have the kind of the sequence of instructions, then the single simple uh, uh, computer that we would kind of design would have instructions, uh, single instructions, something like this. Um, if S plus one is bigger than zero, then jump, you know, to location one, else we don't really need else because if I have a jump and I can jump out of here, then I don't need else because the else is here. So, you know, de facto um, else is my kind of next instruction, which is also of that form, right? But yeah, of course, I have to have some sort of a index of, of where I'm reading stuff from, right? Um, so I, um, yeah, I, I am mistaken. You do need else uh, because you will go here after the else, but this instruction is missing one thing. What, what is this instruction missing? So it has arithmetic, logic, and control flow built in. It has reading, but it's missing the writing, right? So I need S, I need to write, right? So I need to set this location, this location S to zero. So I, um, and of course I'm using here the concept of overflow, right? So this is a kind of an example of a single instruction um, that would satisfy all the requirements for those three things and would allow you to program anything you want using just this kind of logic. And of course the next instruction is exactly the same, right? I mean, if we call this, you know, uh, A, then your program is just A, 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 right? Uh, the, only, the, the only thing is that um, the location from where you're checking the, the if statement, the S1, and where you will write. So here we, instead of um, naming the instruction, because we only have one instruction, so we don't need to name it, we only need to pass kind of the index of this memory thing, right? So here we just write program, which um, basically is a sequence of locations or um, on, on what that instruction operates on. Um, does it make sense? I mean, it probably doesn't, but if you think about it, then eventually it will kind of make sense. So I will write the instruction again. So I have to kind of read from some memory location. Uh, so this is the kind of the, the variable. So the um, here we need the location of memory of where I'm reading stuff from. And if that plus one is bigger than zero, then jump to a program location X. And you know you, you can reference it by lines lines of code, uh, else um, memory the, the the location thing is let's say plus plus or equals zero or something right it doesn't really matter like you just have to have a write so if you have a write and if you have a read and if you have the logic 
and uh, arithmetic operation and control flow, then you can basically code anything you want. Um, all right, so that was just as, you know, if there is a question of how many instruction a virtual machine for universal computer requires, then, you know, you effectively say just one, right? Uh, which is not surprising in a sense for programming, because if you think about the, like how the computer is really produced, you, you, you basically have just NAND gates everywhere, right? So again, it's a single logical fun, um, operator who can emulate anything you really want out of programming. Uh, so it's also a single gate as well, right? Uh, so to express any logic function, uh, you just need one operator, which is NAND, right? Not AND. AND is not enough. Um, and plus not would be enough, um, or plus plus not would be enough as well. Uh, but those are two, right? But if you just want not one, uh, you, you can use NAND. Um, all right. So that's enough for ranting about logic and virtual machines. Uh, let's go next. Uh, expression. This is similar to what we discussed about literals, uh, because again, I think languages which have very um, expressive expressions are nicer to program in and, um, and deal with. I will just make kind of a suggestion here. I, we, we talk directly about statements as well. So what's the difference between a statement and an expression? So what, what, what is an expression? Very good, Hokon. Perfect. So that's a perfect answer. Uh, so everybody take a note. If there is a question in the exam, what's the difference between expressions and statements? That's the you know uh, uh, perfect answer, uh, highest scores. So um, statements is a unit of code. Uh, expression always evaluates to a value. So if I say, Let's say I have um, some sort of x. Um, yeah, let's call it small x. If x is bigger than 10, then, um, and I have another thing called y, um, then uh, y equals 20, else y equals um, 30. Uh, and I, I carry on. Um, is this an expression or is that a statement? This line. It's a statement. So this line is a statement. Um, uh, X plus Y, is that a statement or an expression? So let's start, let's do something simpler is that a statement or an expression? This. This is an expression. So if this is an expression, is this an expression or statement? This is also an expression. Um, if I say z equals x plus one uh, plus uh, y, um, this is a statement but this is still an expression, right? So I have a statement which involves an expression. Um, if I have a call to a function f uh, and I do this, I have 
a parameter which is an expression and this line is a statement because it's a function call right yeah so what if th this is a statement we all agree this line is a statement uh, but what if I do this, right? In some programming languages, you can do that. And this is a statement, is a, it's a, an assignment. Um, in some programming languages, like, okay, let's roll back a little bit, like if I, um, before we deal with that, what if I say, what if I do this? This is a statement, but in some programming languages, this is also an expression which evaluates to a value, right? Uh, this assignment can be a statement um, in some programming languages, but it can be an expression uh, which evaluates to 10. So, we sometimes have things like um, this, right? So we have, this is a statement. The, the, the whole line is a statement, but it is composed of two expressions. One expression, which evaluates to 10, and another expression, which also evaluates to 10 because, you know, that, that right-hand side is 10. So if I, if this is a statement only, then I cannot do this. But if those are expressions, I can do this, right? Because they evaluate to a value and then I can assign a value to a variable, right? Um, so the same is here. If this is a statement, I cannot assign it to a variable because it's a statement. It's just a piece of code, like it's a, a block of code. But if this is an expression, then I can assign a value of this expression to a variable, and then I can evaluate this expression to, to a value, right? So in some languages, the concept of expression and statement is clearly separated, and statements are separate. You cannot assign statements to a variable, and expressions are separate, and expressions always evaluate to a value, and then you can assign a value to a variable, right? But in some programming languages, all statements are expressions, or let's say most st statements are expressions, such that you can assign it to a variable, okay? So in some languages, if I say int f int a is a function definition, it's a statement. So this block of code, is a statement and the statement declares and defines a function for me, function f. In some languages, this is also an expression and I can assign a variable. So I can say d equals this. And this expression declares and defines function for me. And that function is assigned this, this expression is the value of this expression is assigned to d such d becomes a function right um, same here uh, we have a, an expression which evaluates to 20 or 30 right uh, depending what x is the value of this expression will be a number the uh, the, the number will be 20 or 30 and then i'm assigning this number to y so you get it um, does it make sense? For, for people who program only in C or C++, uh, in, in C and C++, the, um, the concept of statement and expression are, are quite separated. Although with um, anonymous functions, you, you do have in C++ kind of a flavor of more expressive uh, things that can become ex expressions instead of just being statements, right? Um, so, um, so let, let, let's summarize it. So in, in, um, in languages where most or majority or a lot of statements 
are also expressions, um, you have more expressive power. You have you can do more things in line. Uh, so, for example, if I <clears throat> if I have if statement being an expression, I can assign. I I can do this as as, as I did before, right? So if I, I can do. Um, yeah, 10 else 20. Uh, so I can have a single line which mixes kind of a, uh, an expression and a statement, like assignment statement. Uh, and, you know, the whole thing is a statement. I mean, it's a block of code, but the if statement is an expression which evaluates to a value. Uh, and then I can do it in one line. In C++ or C or like some other languages where if statement is not an expression, I cannot do that, right? I cannot do this in a single line. Um, you can say, ah, what's the big deal? I mean, you just move um, move this I to, to, to here, right? Um, but already you see, I have to repeat myself. <laughs> I have to type I equals twice. Like, come on, you know, uh, you know, dry. <laughs> Don't repeat yourself. Uh, that's the, the most fundamental thing in programming. Like, you know, we should never repeat ourselves. So I rather do it this way than write I equals twice, right? It, you, you, you see the beauty of if statement being an expression compared to if statement being just a statement. Um, so in languages where you know, a lot of statements are also expressions. You have more expressive power. It's, it's kind of natural. And you can don't repeat yourself more because it, the language just allows you to not repeat yourself that much. Um, all right, enough with ranting. We're running out of time. So let's continue. Uh, we will come back to that. We will learn some new programming languages in which statements that you used to uh, deal with as statements become, you know, expressions. Okay, polymorphism. Um, that is similar to this meta classes classes dis discussion. We come back to that. I don't want to uh, discuss it right now. Um, I just tell you that um, this, uh, the polymorphism has to do with types and with the literals and with constants also. So for example, just kind of as a, as a short, very short uh, site discussion, if I have, um, if I have two uh, as a literal in my code, what type is this literal? Well, it kind of looks like an integer, right? Uh, so it could be an int, but you know, could it be a float? Yes, could be a float. Uh, could it be kind of a double as well? Yeah, could be a double. Uh, if I have complex numbers, can it be a complex number? Maybe, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this literal can have multiple time types, right? If this literal can have multiple types, it's polymorphic, like polymorphic. It means multiple, shapes, multiple types, right? Uh, so polymorphism has to do with how we treat certain things, certain literals or variables or instances and so on. So if I have an object and it is of type X, but I have inheritance hierarchy and it can also be of type Y or you know uh, W, then my instance is polymorphic because it, it can morph into those other types. We will come back to that. So, um, all right. So, to 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 wrap that up, I have a couple of slides, um, uh, and the 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 biggest news kind of of this lecture is that we're gonna learn two programming languages. We're gonna learn Haskell and Rust, but because all of you are also attending cloud computing course, and in cloud computing course, we're gonna learn GoLang. So in, in a way, we're going to learn three programming languages. And you say, OK, why those three programming languages? And why not other ones? And why three? Why not you know, one? <laughs> uh, why not five? Um, well, those are hard questions. Um, some statements about Golang. 
Uh, Golang is kind of like C, but made a bit more contemporary. And it's an example of C made not to deal with memory directly. So Golang has a managed memory model. Uh, it's super easy to learn and super easy to use. Uh, if you know C, you will learn Golang like in an hour, just going the Golang tutor, you go through the, through the syntax and you will know Golang. Uh, there will be maybe one or two gotchas uh, related to references and the life of the references. Like when you allocate memory, the allocation actually lives beyond the, the scope of the function, but we will learn about it. It's super, super simple. Uh, it's good for doing networking in terms of collaborating with others and also programming network stuff. It plays extremely well with Docker. You know, Docker is written in Golang, so here we go. Um, we also need a language where we need to manage memory kind of ourselves. Uh, Golang has managed memory. Uh, Haskell also has managed memory, so we need a language to demonstrate certain things when we manage memory. Uh, we could use C or C++, but you already know them. And Rust is, it has a much more modern feel. Like I actually prefer coding in Rust than coding in C++, although the modern C++ is, has its appeal as well. Um, so I, I, like I'm, I'm not exactly sure which one I like more, but let's learn Rust. And the uh, uh, benefits are that Rust has certain constructs which uh, C++ doesn't. So um, it feels much more expressive than C++. C++ is getting there, but it has a certain baggage that it cannot uh, overcome. Um, so Rust also has a very tiny runtime system compared to Golang, so it's better suited for embedded systems. Um, and it, on some abstract level, Rust and Haskell are very similar. Of course, the syntax is really different. Some of the meta programming and traits things are kind of different, but some things are very similar and you will kind of see the, the similarities between Rust and Haskell. So, and also um, chances are you're not gonna use Haskell later I, unless you fall in love with, with it. We had students in the past, we never taught Rust or Haskell before, but in our bachelor in programming, we had students interested in Haskell and they did use Haskell, for example, for their bachelor thesis in the third year. Uh, we had some students kind of doing uh, even master projects and comparing Haskell productivity to C++ productivity such that they developed kind of a complex game in both of those languages and then compared like pros and cons and so on. So uh, some of you may use Haskell, but for most of you who are coming from the uh, programming background based on C++, you may feel more at home with Rust. Uh, we will see. So th this is kind of Rust and then Haskell. Why Haskell? Um, I think uh, this is kind of the, the example of a, like, you know, pure functional programming language, which is hard to achieve with those other languages. Um, it has a very concise notation such that it has certain appeal of, of expressing stuff, right? So I can write um, a, a short Haskell program, which I want somebody to code in C++, for example, and that will be much shorter than me writing pseudocode in kind of C++ notation or any structured programming notation. It has this sort of a more mathematical feel to itself, such that it's easier to express certain things in it. Uh, and what it means is it's beneficial to be able to read that notation. So even if you're not a Haskell programmer, you don't use it every day. Uh, if you see kind of a, a, a short Haskell function or short Haskell kind of um, um, pseudocode, then you should be able to read it and to understand what the expectation is such that you can code it in a language of choice, right? Um, there is certain appeal to academics and some innovations in languages are coming from Haskell. So for example, some of the stuff that we have in Rust came directly from Haskell. So that's, um, that's uh, quite nice. And Haskell, it's not necessarily difficult um, in a sense of, of understanding the notation or understanding the syntax and things like this. It's kind of difficult in the abstract sense of converting your problems into Haskell, right? Um, so, I have um, 
uh, we're kind of running very, um, yeah, and actually I cannot do it. So what, what I had left was a um, couple of questions, uh, which, um, which were asking you to re, uh, review what we have discussed in this, in this lecture. Uh, and then having some some um, questions for feedback. So those are not working anymore because I sort of uh, kept the the Mentimeter hanging from last from from yesterday from last session. Uh, but we can skip it. So we will I will finish here, um, and I will tell you what will happen next week. Uh, next week we will start with Haskell, um, and we will have kind of a gentle introduction to high Haskell basics. Before we do that, uh, we talk a little bit about standard input and standard outputs and pipes. And I would like you to start reading um, the, um, the book. And we, we're gonna use two books as, um, as sort of a tutorial. Um, the main book for Haskell is Learn, Yourself a, uh, Learn You a Haskell for Great Good. Um, this is the book. We're gonna start from the beginning, and I'm hoping uh, next week we're gonna get to to the end of uh, chapter five, right? Uh, if you start reading it, you will realize it it is a very gentle, very slow moving uh, introduction, um, such that we should kind of in a week get to get to here. Uh, so I would like you to start reading it, make yourself ready to, to do some coding in Haskell, uh, install GHCI and, uh, and stack. Um, and then when, when you have it, uh, you can have a look at the, at the Haskell 01 tasks. So this is kind of a, a specification of some exercises that I would like you to complete um, in the next two weeks, okay? Um, the, the, the beginning is quite easy. You should have no problems, but we will see how it goes. So I may adjust the time frame depending how we move on um, next week. So the task for next week is start reading this book. Um, if you get to the end of section five, then it's, that's what is expected for, for next week. Uh, if we don't get to here, we, which I doubt because it, it is simple, uh, we will kind of do the, the simple syntax, expression statements, uh, if statements, lists, and recursion, and some simple function definitions in, in Haskell next week. So this is, um, this is the plan for, for next week uh, with the preliminary um, end of chapter five being kind of the end of next week. Um, and then we will decide what to do depending what the, how, how the cloud course goes, because I don't want to overload you such that when we start Golang, I want you to have like a week off from Haskell such that you can focus on Golang and then we come back to Haskell after that. So when, uh, depending when Christopher finishes his introduction, it will be either uh, Tuesday or Wednesday uh, because of the of the cloud course, he he says he needs three or four sessions. So if he needs four sessions, we will start Golang the following week, and then we will stop Haskell. Uh, if he stops on Thursday, then we can use Friday already for Golang, and then we don't have a session um, on Monday and Tuesday. The, the, so, so the week which we will have Golang, we will not have this class and we will not have Haskell, right? That's what I'm saying. And I will tell you when it happens, depending how fast uh, Christopher moves with his um, cloud introduction and when we start, uh, when we start Golang in the um, cloud course. That's it. Uh, sorry for going over time. Uh, do you have any questions? So as a prep, you can already start checking Rust as well. And of course, install uh, Rust, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, your Rust compiler and uh, Golang 2. Um, it doesn't matter if you're using Windows or any operating system. It does matter in the cloud course a little bit, uh, such that some exercises are using Docker and you have to use uh, Linux for those. For programming parts, uh, it sort of doesn't matter. Um, so that's all from me. Uh, if there are questions, please um, post them in the chat or in the issue tracker. And we reconvene 
uh, next Monday, we will start with, uh, with Haskell. And um, yeah, we start from the, we basically follow the, this book. So we will kind of start from the beginning all the way to the end of chapter five. Questions? No questions. So thank you very much. And I will see you tomorrow in the cloud course, I guess. Yeah. Bye-bye.